in my work as a performance consultant, I, I have the pleasure of working, <coughs> as already been said, with some of the most talented um, sports performers um, in the UK and, and around the world. <coughs> and um, one of the things about working with these people is that they have such immense self-belief. And working in this area, it was, it was nice to see that we're, the theme of this evening is the possibility of people, because that is something really close to my heart. So I thought today we would talk about belief and the power of belief and, uh, and how it actually affects people. So I will get people come to see me, and invariably it's because they have limiting beliefs. They have problems. They will come to me and they say, I am talentless. I am useless. I have no idea. I had a client come to see me the other day and she said to me, I have absolutely no confidence at all. And I said to her, are you confident of that? And she said, yes. <laughs> um, beliefs are extraordinary things. Beliefs are the things that guide our lives. We, we, we either get enhanced by them or we, we get shattered by them. Um, people who have uh, really enhancing beliefs, then they, play the, they have these wonderful imaginations and they, they play wonderful images in their mind and they, they're led by these wonderful images. Those people who, who have fear and worry and anxiety and stress, then they play movies of disaster all of the time. <coughs> and the thing about beliefs is that, um, that they're actually based on very flimsy evidence, very often. You think about how you get your beliefs. Think about maybe a throwaway remark that was made to you when you were maybe eight, nine, ten years old, which you kind of took hold of and, and accepted. You know, when someone said you were uncoordinated, and they said, oh, yes, I am uncoordinated. When someone says that you can't do this or you can't do that, and we kind of accept it. But our beliefs are just kind of guesses. They're best guesses. We, we act as if they're true, but very often they're not. Um, I had a golfer who came to see me the other day. He uh, is a professional golfer. He said to me, I always play badly on the 15th hole at Wentworth. So we kind of talked about this, because I knew he'd played there quite a lot. It was based on two occasions. Two in a row, he hit the ball right into the trees. From then onwards, there was a rule. The rule was, this was an unlucky hole. What happens to the imagery that he plays in his mind? He plays imagery of disaster. So he expects to hit the ball in the trees, and guess what? He goes and does it again. We live up or we live down to our expectations. So what we believe decides the kind of life we're going to have. As um, Henry Ford once said, um, if you think you can do something or you think you cannot do something, you are right. So in this... Um, Olympic year, we've got um, a lot of people with immense belief to look back on. These great Olympians, people like Bob Beeman. Who remembers Bob Beeman? Bob Beeman, 1968. This is a guy who's driven by such belief that he would put in all the training that was required to become the great athlete that he became. Bob Beeman is known for the great leap, the one leap that he did. In the final of the Olympic Games in 1968, his very, very first jump. This is a time when records were being bought and beaten by half a centimetre, maybe a centimetre. Bob Beeman beat the world record by 55 centimetres. In old money, that's nearly two feet. In fact, they had a, um, they had a fixed gauge um, to, to measure the length of um, the, the jumps. 
and it wasn't far enough for him. They had to actually get an old-fashioned tape measure out to measure it. When Bob Beeman saw 8 metres 90 on the board, he thought it was for a 100-metre race. He couldn't equate it with what he'd ever done. We have people like Steve Redgrave. Steve Redgrave, I mean, such immense belief that he drove himself not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, five times, five Olympic Games to win five gold medals. This is a guy who had severe ulcerative colitis. He was in complete pain for a lot of the time. And then he was diagnosed with diabetes, but his belief is a thing that drove him to keep training, keep practicing, keep going. We have um, Tanny Gray um, Thompson, born with spina bifida, but decides to become an athlete. And she goes and wins 11 gold medals at the Paralympics and five other medals as well. And now we've got Usain Bolt. I mean, what an extraordinary person he is. You look at this guy, does this guy have belief? This guy has oodles belief. And it's the belief that drives him to put in the work that's required. It's not natural talent, it's just belief that drives you. You see the goal and you see all the parts of the goal that are gonna allow you to achieve that. <coughs> I personally have a favorite he hero. Her name was Wilma. I'm not talking about Fred Flintstone's wife. She is one of my heroes, but uh, I prefer Betty, actually. But uh, <laughs> Wilma, Wilma Rudolph. Some of you may have heard of her, some of you maybe not. Wilma Rudolph had the most extraordinary early life. She was born in 1940. She was a, a black American. She was born in Tennessee at a time of segregation. The first four years of her life, she had more things to struggle with than people would have in five to ten lifetimes. She was born the 20th child out of 22 siblings. Yeah. She was born prematurely and she was only just over four pounds when she was born. But that was just the beginning of the struggles. Over the next four years, she had one illness after another. She had severe whooping cough, not unusual for those times, but it was pretty severe. But then it went on to, um, she had uh, scarlet fever, which she nearly died from. And then she had double pneumonia, which she nearly died from. And then at the age of four, she was struck down with polio and was paralyzed. Her left leg was paralyzed and she was told categorically by her doctor that she would never walk again. Now, this is where belief comes in because the doctor believed she would never walk again. Her parents, her mother in particular, told her she would walk again. At the age of four, Wilma Rudolph had a choice whether to, decide to, whether to believe the highly experienced doctor or her mother. Fortunately, she chose her mother. Over the next two years, they, she had to make two round trips of 100 miles a week in the back of a bus because of segregation, they had to give up the seat if a white person came on the bus. But because the, near, the nearest um, hospital that would treat her was 50 miles away. So twice a week, 50 miles there, 50 miles back, to get the necessary treatment on her leg. Because her parents believed that she would walk again. After two years of this, with the use of a an orthopaedic shoe and a brace, she could stand up and she could walk. A little bit gingerly to start with. But as the years progressed, and with the help of all her two million siblings, she actually got better at walking. So by the age of nine, 
she was good enough to take off the brace. So she defied everything the doctors ever believed. Two years later, she could take off the orthopedic shoe that was keeping her foot straight. And she became like a normal child. Such is the power of belief. We have a thing that's known, and I'm sure you've heard of it, as the placebo effect. The placebo is the most tested drug there is. Why? Because for every drug out there that is tested, legally, you have to have a placebo to test it against. And some really interesting things can happen. Did you know how powerful a bit of sugar could be? Well, certain sugar pills, with nothing else in it apart from a bit of colouring, have been known on occasions to perform as well as the drug they're testing themselves. My favourite example of an experiment done with, um, on the placebo effect was done in Japan. And I think it can only be done in Japan. They took um, 13 students and they blindfolded them. Now, I think these students must have had um, pretty high student loans to pay off because um, I don't know why they would done this, um, agreed to do this anyway, but they agreed to have poison ivy rubbed down one of their arms. So they're 13 students and they're having poison ivy rubbed down their arms. And each one of the students, as you would expect, comes out in rashes, red marks. Some of them had ulceration boils come up. But the interesting thing was, it wasn't poison ivy. It was just a harmless plant. But the belief had allowed every single one of them to react to it. But that wasn't the end of the experiment, because they had another arm to play with. So on the other arm, might as well use it while they're blindfolded and we're paying them one time. They told them they were rubbing a harmless plant. Except in this occasion, it was poison ivy. Out of the 13 students, only two of them showed any symptoms at all from the poison ivy. This is the power of placebo. Placebo works in a way that it works with our expectations. So when we expect something, we vividly imagine it. And when we vividly imagine it, we fire up the same neurons in the brain as if it was actually happening. So what happens? The body prepares for that eventuality. So that the the brain is always tell, already telling you to react to the poison ivy, even though it isn't there. So I believe that Wilma Rudolph was powerfully affected by her sense of placebo, of effect. So she carried on becoming gradually more like the other children. So over these years of determination and self-belief and this progression that she made from being someone who was essentially paralyzed to someone who could walk normally, well, it just carried on on a, on a tangent. So she started playing basketball because her sister did and her sister was quite good and she liked the idea of playing basketball. But then she started running and she started challenging people to races. And she challenged people to a race and she'd come last. And she'd challenge to another game, she'd come last again. Another race, she'd come last again. But next time, ah, she came second to last. And then she came third to last. Eventually, she started winning these races. And then after a period of time, she was representing the school and winning races for the school. She was winning every single race that she went into. She got so good that by the time she was only 16, and this is only five years after she could walk at all, 
a run at all. She went in for the national trials for the Olympics in 1956 and got into the 100 metre relay team to go to Melbourne, 9,000 miles away, where she won a bronze medal. Now, you would think that would be the height of accomplishment, but it wasn't. Because four years later, Wilma Rudolph went to the Rome Olympics and won the 100 metres gold medal. Beat the world record, although it was wind assisted. But she also won the 200 metres gold. She anchored the 100 metre team up against a very good British team, apparently. And she got the baton behind everyone else. But she came through and won the gold medal there as well in world record time. What she did, she had belief. The imagery she played in her mind was positive and that made her determined to achieve things. She was brought up on positivity in a nurturing family. Now everyone here may have already but could still accomplish wonderful goals. We just need to feed our imagination. We need to have expectation, the same as Wilma Rudolph. So if you feed your imaginations, if you look for what's possible rather than what's impossible, then you will get the success that you crave. Thank you.